Palomares Broken Arrow. The National Museum of Nuclear Science and History in Albuquerque, New Mexico, is home to a unique artifact, a nuclear warhead available for viewing by the public. It looks like a simple 10-foot-long metal capsule, dented and dinged, but it is the remains of a once deadly hydrogen bomb that was lost over the skies of Spain. It's called a broken arrow, a euphemism the US military uses for a lost nuclear weapon. That's exactly what occurred on January 17, 1966. Due to the Cold War, American B-52 bombers patrolled the skies of Europe around the clock, ever diligent to react quickly to the threat of a Soviet nuclear attack. At 10.20 a.m., on that fateful day, one such B-52 was flying along the Turkish-Soviet border. In need of refueling, the bomber moved over the southern coast of Spain. A KC-135 Strato tanker was ready to conduct a mid-air refueling of the bomber when all of a sudden tragedy struck. The bomber came in too fast and collided with the tanker, triggering a violent explosion. All crewmen aboard the KC-135 were killed, and four of the seven crewmen aboard the bomber were able to eject before their plane broke apart. Wreckage from the planes rained down upon Palomares, a small coastal community. This included the bomber's payload of four Mark 28 thermonuclear weapons. Three of the bombs landed safely but the third parachuted into the Mediterranean a few miles off the coast. The nuclear warheads did not detonate, but the conventional explosives on two of them ignited on land, sending radioactive material across the community. Eventually, in April 1966, a submarine found the lost bomb and it was recovered. The U.S. conducted an extensive cleanup operation and still, as of 2015, aids Spain with radiation monitoring and contaminated materials removal. 7. The Falk Monster It's a simple wire mesh screen, about 5 and 1 half inches tall, 8 inches long, made of metal and attached to an old piece of wood. It is housed at the International Cryptozoology Museum in Maine and it appears innocuous. However, it is evidence of a horrifying encounter with what people call the Falk Monster. It's 1964, Falk, Arkansas, young Mary Beth Searcy is at home doing schoolwork. She feels a chill and goes to close the window when she notices something odd. She looks out into the moonlit front yard and sees a hairy animal on two legs coming towards her. She screams in terror, locks the window and spends the rest of the evening staring at the screen, a small piece of which remains on display at the museum. Years go by, it's 1971, Bobby Ford and his wife Elizabeth share a new home in Falk. Bobby goes hunting, leaving Elizabeth alone. She falls asleep and is awakened by a moving window curtain. She goes to check and a hairy arm reaches in for her. She screams as she jumps back, catching a glimpse of the creature's piercing red eyes. The animal retreats back into the darkness. When Bobby returns and finds his terrified wife, he immediately reloads his gun and goes to find the creature. He soon sees it, a shaggy-haired beast, with sharp claws, standing nearly seven feet tall. He shoots at the beast and it runs off. As he heads home the beast surprises him and throws him to the ground. Breaking away, Bobby escapes to his home and immediately calls the police. They find huge pieces of the home's woodwork ripped away by large claws, as well as large tracks. People in Falk are sure that something horrifying lurks in the swamps of Arkansas. 6. The Boy Scouts Atomic Energy Patch At the American Museum of Science and Energy, AMSE, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, visitors can see an example of the now discontinued Atomic Energy Merit Badge, awarded by the Boy Scouts of America, one of the largest youth organizations in the United States. One young man named David Charles Hahn became the first scout in the history of his troop to earn the badge and in doing so nearly caused a radioactive disaster. In 1994, Hahn was captivated by chemistry and secretly conducted experiments in the backyard shed of his mother's house in Commerce Township, Michigan. He worked hard amassing radioactive material by collecting minute amounts that could be found in household products. He was able to create his own homemade nuclear reactor at age 17. Though his reactor never reached critical mass, it did emit dangerous levels of radiation, over 1,000 times that of normal background radiation. Han knew this was serious and began to dismantle his reactor. He drew attention to himself when police pulled him over and found radioactive material in his backseat. This resulted in a federal radiological emergency response involving the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Ultimately, 
his mother's property was designated a Superfund hazardous material site and the Environmental Protection Agency was called in to seize and dispose of all the property as low-level radioactive waste. Han was awarded his Eagle Scout rank shortly after the incident, and the nickname, the Radioactive Boy Scout. 5. Authentic Alien Artifact If you visit the National Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas, Nevada, you will see something that is truly rare to find, an exhibit labeled Authentic Alien Artifact. The exhibit includes vials containing small metallic fragments. These fragments are from the crash of an unknown object that occurred high on Mount Izvestkovaya, in Russia. Known as the Russian Roswell, the crash occurred on January 29, 1986, around 7.55 p.m. Witnesses watched as an odd red sphere darted across the sky over the town of Dalnigursk, jerking wildly before it crashed into the mountain. Witnesses reported the crash site burned bright for an hour. A researcher from the Academy of Sciences was the first to arrive at the crash site. He collected samples of the peculiar metallic debris that was scattered about the mountainside, along with scorched plants and rocks. A U.S. journalist traveled to the site some years later and was allowed to view the debris. He described perfectly round metallic and glassy spheres. He brought some of this debris back to the United States for testing and exhibition. American scientists, like their Russian counterparts, discovered the debris demonstrated strange properties. Though metallic, the debris was very different from normal iron, appearing to partially contain gold-like fiber threads. When melted in a vacuum, some debris would spread out, while others would condense into the ball-like objects. Scientists never came to a consensus as to the nature of the objects or their structure. The only thing they could really agree on was that some ash found at the crash site was biological meaning something was alive when the object crashed, possibly a stray dog or a flock of birds caught in the explosion, or, incredibly, someone was inside the object when it went down. 4. The UFO Car On August 27, 1979, something extraordinary happened to Val Johnson. Johnson was a deputy sheriff in Marshall County, Minnesota. He was on duty that evening, driving near the North Dakota border. He spotted a brilliant light through his side window. Believing at first it was a low-flying plane, he turned to get a better look. He then noticed the light was now moving towards him, traveling incredible fast. As the light grew closer, he was blinded. He remembers hearing glass breaking but then lost consciousness. When he awoke, his car was stalled and had skidded across the highway. He radioed for assistance and an ambulance was called. Johnson was determined to be in a mild state of shock. His eyes were irritated and they appeared to be suffering from flash burns, known also as welder's burns. What is stranger is the condition of his vehicle. A driver's side headlight was shattered. There was a circular dent on the left side of the hood, close to the windshield. And, there was a large crack in the windshield on the driver's side, with four apparent impacts. The roof antenna was bent at a 60-degree angle, and the trunk antenna was bent at a 90-degree angle. All the damage was on the driver's side of the vehicle. Even odder, the vehicle's electric clock was now running 14 minutes slow, as was Johnson's wristwatch. An investigation was conducted with experts from Ford Motors and Honeywell Engineering examining the vehicle. No explanation could be found for what caused the damage. All anyone knows is Johnson's account that an incredible bright light raced towards him and apparently slammed into his vehicle, causing the damage, blinding him, and knocking him unconscious. The vehicle now resides in the Marshall County Museum, with a plaque reading, U.F.O. Car. 3. Betty Hill's Dress. Betty and Barney Hill were the very first to ever report that they had been abducted by aliens. In the many years since their report it appears their case is still the most convincing. It was the early hours of September 20, 1961, the Hills were on vacation. They were driving from Niagara Falls to their home in New Hampshire, when they sighted a strange object in the sky. Barney pulled out his binoculars and viewed the object before panicking and driving quickly away. They remembered hearing a beeping sound and then, instantly, they found themselves some 35 miles further down the road, hearing the same beeping sound again. Once home the couple experienced anxiety and nightmares, they wanted to know what occurred during that lost 35-mile trek that they couldn't recall. The couple agreed to being placed under hypnosis and recalled what happened during their missing time, which was actually two hours. 
In separate sessions, Betty and Barney recalled vividly being followed by the object in the sky and eventually stopped, pulled from their vehicle by some alien creatures and given medical examinations before being placed back into their car. The Hills recalled that the aliens were not malicious but fascinated by many little things, such as Barney's false teeth. After the event, Betty's dress was covered in some type of pink powder, leaving stains wherever it lay. She kept the dress and cut off small sections of it to satisfy the numerous requests for testing. No one in all these years has provided any clue as to the origin of the pink powder. In 2009, an archive composed of audio tapes, transcripts of their hypnotic sessions, and the powder-covered dress, were donated to the University of New Hampshire in Durham, where they remain to this day. To The Exorcist Cross 1973's The Exorcist was a chilling film, based on William Peter Blatty's book, about a child possessed by a demon who undergoes an exorcism. This supernatural thriller gave many who saw it nightmares. What many might not know is that the story was based on the real exorcism of Roland Doe, a pseudonym assigned by the Catholic Church. Most of the details about Roland's possession and exorcism come from a journal kept by Father Raymond Bishop. It all began in January 1949, Roland was a 14-year-old teen living in Maryland. The Doe family began hearing strange noises in their home, seeing objects moving by themselves, and finding strange scratches on the walls. They contacted their local parish priest who, after keeping Roland under observation for a night, concluded that an evil entity was present. He recommended the rites of exorcism. Numerous priests were called in to assist and Roland was taken to the Election Brothers Hospital in St. Louis. Witnesses reported the words evil and hell appearing on Roland's body during the course of the exorcism. The rites were performed over 30 times over the course of several weeks. Finally, it was over and Roland returned to normal. The exorcism was supervised by Father William Bowdern, along with Father Bishop, a young Father Walter Halloran, and six other priests who all signed the ecclesiastical documents certifying Roland's experience as a real demonic possession. Father Halloran, the last of the priests, passed away in 2005, admitting that in all the years since, he always kept tabs on the young Roland as he grew. The hospital is long gone, but today, in St. Louis City Museum, visitors can see the large cross that hung in the east wing of Election Brothers, from near the room where it all took place. 1. The Annabelle Doll In 1970, a thoughtful mother bought a vintage Raggedy Ann doll as a present for her daughter, Donna. Donna, and her roommate Angie, began to notice that the doll, normally sitting on Donna's bed as a decoration, was appearing all over the house. Neither woman moved the doll but it seemed as if it was relocating itself on its own. Then one night, Donna noticed what appeared to be blood on the doll's hands and chest. The women decided to seek help. They contacted a medium and conducted a seance. It was determined that the doll was home to the playful spirit of Annabelle Higgins, a seven-year-old who died on the property upon which the apartment building was built. Believing the spirit only wanted companionship, they welcomed Annabelle and the doll into their lives. However, they would soon find out that the spirit was not as benevolent as it claimed. The spirit began appearing vindictive against the women's friend, Lou. He would claim the doll would attack him when left alone. Another instance, when alone in a room with the doll, his chest was slashed and left bleeding. They had finally had enough and called a priest who recommended paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren. The Warrens believed the doll was indeed inhabited by a demonic presence. An exorcism was conducted and the apartment cleansed. The Warrens took the doll with them when they left but were immediately plagued with strange occurrences until Ed doused the doll with holy water. They built a special case for the doll inside their occult museum in Monroe, Connecticut, where it resides to this day. Since being placed in the case, the doll no longer appears to move on its own, though a warning has been posted never to unlock the case.